Well, it's good to be here. Today we're going to start a journey in TCM, which is the short form for traditional Chinese medicine. And in front of you, you have um, a book that I've uh, put together, Foundation Manual for Practitioners and Doctors by myself. And it's here at the College of International Holistic Studies, CIHS, Milton. So TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, what does that mean to you? What, uh, what brings you here? What does that encompass? Herbs. Herbs. It, it, it encompasses the cause of um, disease or discomfort or pain. Right. Okay. So it encompasses much more than just acupuncture. Acupuncture is one part of TCM. Okay, so if we look at our TOC, which is your table of contents, you'll see that we will do a brief historical overview on how uh, traditional Chinese medicine developed. Um, Wang Di Jing, everybody repeat it. Wang Di Jing. Wang Di Jing. Wang Di Jing. Wang Di Jing. Okay, uh, very famous book. We'll be speaking about, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, tell Barack Obama I'll be there in about an hour. <laughs> okay. So we have the historical overview, which we're going to be going over to, uh, this weekend. Wang Di Jing. We're going to discuss the concepts of traditional Chinese medicine, like yin-yang theory, the six environmental factors, the seven emotional factors, the seven miscellaneous factors, the five elements, the theory of qi, ju, jin, and yi, Jing Shen, the eight principles and diagnostic techniques. This is just something in a nutshell, just to give you an idea of where we're going to go, uh, but we're going to do much more than that. Um, so acupuncture, how long has it been around? What do you think? You know, well, some people say three, some people say 5,000 years uh, of acupuncture has been around, so it's not a new idea, okay? Um, two of the most significant periods are the pre-scientific, uh, supernatural, and the rational science and medical period. So we have the late Zhu and Qin dynasties, the foundation of rational science, where medicine was developed. Um, the beginnings of TCM are somewhat obscure, but can be understood by studying the Shang, Zhu, and the Warring States period. Um, so you can take notes and... Uh, um, and look at the uh, PowerPoint, uh, because basically, um, for next time, you're going to give me a copy of all of the uh, periods that China has, amazing periods that they have historically. But we're going to just focus on the Shangzhou and Warring States, uh, where uh, the traditional Chinese um, medicine developed. So there are three legendary emperors, Shandong, Wang Di and Fu Si are said to be the originators of TCM. Now, Wang Di Neijing, uh, the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine, um, is, as is ascribed to Wang Di. Um, he's believed to have lived between uh, those dates, 2697 to 2596 BC. Um, but I do have to tell you that the Wang Di Neijing was not written by him, and we're going to talk more about the Wang Di Neijing, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the history. So the earliest times, stones, um, stone needles were used. Later, needles made out of bone and bamboo were developed, because people ask, well, how did this develop? And uh, uh, there are many different theories, okay? So... Um, uh, how did the Bible develop? How did the Quran develop? How did the, um, you know, some of these more sacred books develop? Um, sometimes people meditated. We had time to meditate a long time ago. You know, there, we didn't have the distractions of internet, uh, texting, and uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, it, it was done. We had Twitter, but we, we did it telepathically. So uh, some people will say that the Chinese inherited this the same way that some of our great books manifested. You know, that they just came through, they, they, they were channeled through. But um, there are some scientific studies that say that, you know, they found 
um, needles made out of bone and bamboo, and then later metal needles had evolved by the time that uh, the compilations began from the Wang Di Ni Jing, which is the book. And then the second point that I've got on the PowerPoint is saying that um, there's also a theory that the Buddhist monks meditated and chanted for a healing system come through them so that they could help populace. Okay, so they're different theories. The third theory is an uh, arrow wounded a warrior, okay, because they were using bows and arrows. And the arrow was removed and the wound healed and a disease in an unrelated part of the body was cured. Mm -hmm. And there were observant physicians that noticed that there was like this line, this meridian, between the punctured point and the disease uh, it cured. So location, acupoint, was very important. Therefore, they started looking at channels and these lines and, and meridians, um, connecting points to these lines, and they realized that there were therapeutic effects. They also realized that if they got a stone, or some, if they just massaged an area that was painful, we call a painful point, we can call it an ashy point, or an ash point, and they massaged it that it would feel better. And so, so this developed also. Did heat make it feel better, or did cold make it feel better? Okay? So, the shift from pre-scientific uh, medical practice to rational and scientific tradition, along with the reliance on natural principles, uh, formed the basis of traditional Chinese medicine. During the first century BC, Confucian social and political theorists laid the social foundation for the unification of these developing scientific theories. This led to the provision of structure and formalized subsequent scientific and medical inquiry. Now that's important because a lot of people just say, well, you know, I want to go uh, you know, to a Western prescription drugs because there's so much documented research. But uh, the Chinese actually did a lot of, uh, you know, they, they, they did their own research. Uh, we know there are some points that warm the channel. There are some points that, cool, that can cool you, right? There are some points that can help relieve dampness, okay? Or astringe, the same as in herbs. We have cooling, soothing calming points, calming herbs. So this didn't just happen. This happened over 5,000 years ago with a very serious scientific and uh, scientific and, and uh, very serious medical inquiry, totally documented. And from this, TCM developed. Okay, We're going to go on to this because you will, pro you know, in your practice, have people that are non-believers or even family members and say, well, I don't believe in all that. Uh, but So you need to have some background and understanding how this developed and why you're doing it. You know, it works whether you believe or disbelieve, right? But it's good to have uh, a little background on how it all started. So you see a little picture there. And this refers to the scripts carved by the ancients of the Shang dynasty on what kind of shells? What kind of shells? Yeah. And ox scapulas, the shoulder blades, which are considered to be the earliest written language of China. Okay? So in 1899, Wang Yirong, an official under the Qing dynasty, fell ill. One of the herbal medicines that was prescribed by his physician was called Longgu. Now this is something we use in Chinese medicine. It is a herb under... Uh, oh, you, I thought you took it. It is a herb under the category of calming, sedation, okay? Calming someone down. So they turned these uh, Longu dragon bones turned out to be fragments of turtle shells which were found to bear strange carved patterns on them. So he kept these, uh, he kept the Longu, the dragon bones, and showed them uh, to people who after carefully studied them and came to the conclusion that these carvings were written over 3,000 years before and they were of great historical significance. Okay. Further inquiries revealed that this dragon bone had been unearthed at various parts of uh, China, um, including the Shang Dynasty capital. Um, they made further digs and they found over 100,000 pieces of bones and shells shells all carved with words and there were about 4,500 different characters and um, 1,700 have been deciphered. 
So, you know, we have the Simpsons, we have the Shungs. Well, they were a superstitious, a superstitious people. Uh, their rulers uh, at this time uh, were shamans. Okay, so they um, did a lot of divina divination and asked the gods to help them uh, for storms or if they needed water, rain. Um, they helped them for when there was epidemics or famine. Before going to a war, they would um, work with shamanic rituals. Again, we, we know that we have the, um, we know many shamans from different cultures, okay, from the Mayan culture, um, North American Indians, and also the Chinese. Uh, so we have many cultures that uh, were working with uh, spirit and shamanism. Okay, in the Zhu uh, dynasty, uh, again, Zhu rituals, and the ancient book recorded the social conditions in the Zhu dynasty. Here, doctors already were started to be classified into physicians, surgeons, dietitians, and veterinarians. And uh, I'm really pleased to uh, be here at this time because I wouldn't want a surgeon at that time to be working on me. Although you never know. Uh, but I do know that uh, there was a Chinese doctor later on who actually developed anesthesia. So he wasn't around under the Zhu dynasty. Um, diagnostic methods included observation. And this is very important for all of us because we are still doing this to this day. We have our list of... Uh, the basic ten questions, but now we've expounded on the ten questions. We're asking much more uh, of the people just to get a better picture of each person. Because traditional Chinese medicine is holistic, okay? So here, we're already seeing in the Zhu dynasty that it's, it actually is becoming very holistic. We're observing, we're listening, we're smelling, okay? And that's how they were able to diagnose certain diseases. They also started to um, report on what caused this death. So uh, they were already doing CIHS so long before mm -hmm. it became a hit series. Okay, rigorous scientific approach was the medical practice. Now, according to the record of history, there was famous doctors, Chun Yuyi in the Western Han Dynasty. He kept all the case studies and records of his patients with the outcome thereby improving his understanding and practice. Um, meticulous method and protocol was used. Okay, so again, what I'm trying to reinforce in all of you, that this isn't just some Mickey Mouse art form, art form or medical um, practice. This has really been documented. And uh, it is also not just for someone who comes in for, you know, oh, I've got a backache, I've got a neck ache. Uh, we are talking some serious um, health challenges. According to the WHO, World Health Organization, there's over 120, 130 um, health challenges that TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, can help. So the development of diagnostics in the Ming and Qing di dynasties um, contains even more aspects, which next time you are going to be working on all of your... Um, your overview on the uh, on the history of China, right? We're going to do that. So then we're going to put it all together. Today we're just going to give you like an overview of the curve of what happened. It's not a history lesson, but just to give you an idea of where it comes from. Now the warring states were very important. Basically thought of as the second part of the Eastern Zhu Dynasty. Um, and. Uh, the Warring States was derived from uh, the record, a historically compiled um, work early in the Han Dynasty. Um, while it is frequently cited that 475 BC, um, following the spring and autumn period, 403 BC, the date of the tripartition of the Jin, is also sometimes considered as the beginning of the period. Just so you have an idea of uh, the um, different times and the different periods. So we've mentioned three periods. What are they? Everybody together. What was the first period? Shen. Shen. Yeah. Zhang. Well, we call it the Zhou. 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 And the Warring States, which is the second part of the Zhou period. Said to be. Okay, so let's say it again. The three periods. Shen. Zhou. Okay, so Shen. Zhou and Warring States. Okay. 
warring states. Very interesting. Two philosophical ideologies. What are they? Yeah, very, very profound, very profound. Um, also, the warring states saw the proliferation of ironworking in China, replacing bronze as the dominant metal used in warfare. Um, different, de um, different philosophies uh, developed into the hundred schools of thought. Um, let's put that part of your homework too. Uh, Google hundred schools of thought. So that's your third bit of homework. Your first one is to do the overview of uh, Chinese history. The second one is to look at the Opium Wars, which is part of the history. And the third one would be Google 100 schools of thought. Okay. So including in the warring states, again, we're developing a lot of philosophical um, thought. Confucianism. Um, it is possible to see that the philosophy espoused in the texts of various people, including Zhuang Ji, is separate from what could be considered classical Taoism. Um, okay. So we had we started to get a lot of, and and this is I included this because. Uh, when you go to Chinese stores, you see a lot of carvings out of jade. So this started happening in the warring states. And even today, jade is so important, uh, even in Chinese medicine. Um, we're looking at those jade beds um, because they naturally, the, the jade is one of the only um, jade mineral, mineral gems, minerals that, that release farm for red. Okay, so that's why even on those $5,000 jade massage beds, they're using pure jade because the farm for red um, can help with the healing, um, take it further into the uh, bone as opposed to just heat. Okay. So if we talk a little bit about Confucianism, what do, you, what is, what do people know here? What do you know about uh, Confucianism? Okay, but you remember, Confucius says, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically it resulted in a basically feudal and totalitarian system of government that still exists today. Um, Confucianism imposed on medicine and was opposed to the development of an anatomy and surgery, one of its main tenets being that the whole body was sacred and should remain complete throughout life and also in death. Taoism, Taoism literally means the way and maintaining harmony between man and his world, between the world and beyond. Um, the Tao, or the way, has been linked to a separate creed called Taoism, but its basic naturalistic philosophies permeate all Chinese thought and religion, including Buddhism, yin and yang, are very much part of the Tao, as the Book of Changes states, one yang, one yang, being called the Tao. The religion of Taoism became formalized during the Warring States period, and uh, they also had several different types of uh, books um, on on the way. Okay, um, we're going to go on a little bit on in the 19th century, just to give you an idea, because the Shang, Zhou, and the Warring States are kind of. Uh, so much was, we are still using that information today. So that's why I've included it as our, our focal points for uh, the history of TCM. But in the 19th century, um, after Chinese, uh, China came to know Western medicine, which the British brought with them after the first Opium Wars, um, there was still a distrust of Western medicine. Perhaps it was due to the Opium Wars, that's something you're going to find out in your homework next week. In 1927, Chiang Kai-shek uh, became the national president. Um, they didn't think that highly of uh, TCM, calling it unscientific quackery. Okay? In fact, they went as far as putting a ban on it with strong protests from the public. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, I will be honest with you, not every book states this, and many people won't like it, uh, but it's part of the history, and um, we have to uh, present history as it was. And, and I think it's understandable, one can understand, you know, you're having all of these, Western medicine is so wonderful for all of their tests that they can do. Okay, so again, um, you know, their development in surgery, you know, in ER, amazing stuff. You know, you're not going to come to an acupuncturist if someone's limb is hanging out from a car accident. So um, when all of this modern technology was developing, of course, um, you know, some people would think that it was uh, unscientific quackery. But in 1949, uh, when Mao uh, was established after the overthrow of Chiang Kai-shek, Mao brought it back um, into um, popular popularity. Soon after, in 1950, the first National Hygiene Conference brought forth a new set of medical princi principles, which included TCM, another way of Mao preserving Chinese heritage. At the time, there were about 650 million people and 10,000 physicians trained in Western medicine to serve this huge population. So you can imagine, to cope with this inadequate system, about half a million TCM practitioners were integrated into the public health service. Okay? Now, Chinese medicine is wonderful pre for prevention. And what I'm not hearing from Obama or Hillary or any of these, uh, you know, politicians is prevention. I did hear one, one use cast, it was just slipped by, and they say, oh, well, prevention would cost too much. I don't think so, okay? Uh, I believe it was uh, Dr. Mary Wu from TSTCM, she did with some other people, they did a couple of years ago um, uh, something on stroke prevention, how much it would save uh, the Canadian government a year, and it would be $200 million, and nothing was done with it. Why? Because they probably make $2 billion on... Mm -hmm not preventing it. So, uh, I don't know if this is going to be part of a recording, but again, it's part of uh, our understanding of why things are the way they are. I will say one thing, we have gone one way. In Burlington now, uh, they are, it is under OHIP, weight loss with acupuncture, using acupuncture. It, it is an acupuncture protocol. So, OHIP is our, is the Canadian um, health plan that uh, people don't have to pay for. So, uh, we are making headway, you know, where acupuncture is part of a protocol and OHIP play, pays for it, that's amazing. Because as you know, OHIP does not cover TCM, right? Mm -hmm. Extended health care does. Uh, we have a limited amount. Some people have 200 some people have $300, other 500 per person, okay? Uh, but uh, I think the more people get better and the more politicians and their wives and their children start using this, you know, there will be a change. Uh, because we can't just maintain uh, disease and health challenges. We cannot just maintain this. We, you know, we, we want to get better. We, and we won't, don't want all the side effects from all of the farmies. Anyway, as a result, going back to Mao, as a result, the barefoot doctors evolved as a unique part of the medical system to suit the needs of rural China. And they became the mainstream in the 1970s. These practitioners were recruited at the local level to work in native villages. Okay, I will be speaking more about barefoot doctors later on, but this gives you kind of like an overall uh, idea of where uh, this all came from, where this uh, came from. Okay, here we see uh, Wang Di Nei Jing, and we're going to talk about one of the most famous books uh, that we still rely upon, today in Chinese medicine. So the first century AD brought the most important classic text. Uh, it was called the Inner Classic and it was based on Taoism. Uh, it has two sections called the Suven, which is the essential or plain questions of organic and fundamental nature, and the Ling Shu, which is the miraculous pivot, um, which is a technical acupuncture book. Miraculous pivot, not ticket. Mm -hmm. Okay, who did that? 